to baptism has long been debated in the so-called Christian faiths. While we all profess to follow Jesus and the New Testament, we see that uh, some question the teachings that are quite plainly revealed in God's Word. In fact, I was just having a discussion this morning with a sister and asking her, why do people reject the truth? Well, there's many reasons that we can look at, but that would be another lesson. Recently, when I was looking at my Facebook and I saw that a brother in Christ, he shared an article by a gentleman named Gene Sanford. Uh, I don't know who Gene Sanford is. I did share the article in your bulletin this morning so that you have the full article, but I want to read part of it to you because, you know, as we study the Bible and we were trying to lead people to truth, many times the subject, the question of baptism becomes a stumbling block. You know, is baptism something that is required, is it essential? And so we see that there are many questions on this topic. Now, Mr. Sanford, he writes, one of the great mysteries of the so-called Christian world is that despite whatever else people may believe and do religiously, all want to be saved. I think if you were to go around and pretty much you'd ask anybody, you know, if there's a choice between whether you want to be in heaven or hell, I don't think there's going to be too many people that are going to choose hell. I know there's a few that said they'd rather be in hell than you know, to be with God. And you know, they don't fully understand what they're saying. But I think, you know, given the choice, the majority are going to say heaven. But when we think about this, are we doing the things that God says that are required to get to heaven? And Mr. Sanford goes on, the mystery being that very few want to be saved the way that the Lord very clearly declares in the New Testament. In Matthew 19, or I'm sorry, Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, he gave very explicit instructions. Go into the world and teach. Notice that. Go into the world and preach the gospel. He says to go into the world teaching and baptizing. He did not just say go and teach. And although what Jesus taught was uh, the absolute essentiality of believing in him to be the Christ, what we read in John 8, verse 24. It is especially significant that he didn't say, just get people to believe in him. That's all. Just teach and get people to believe. Instead, he said to teach his words, the gospel, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, why in the world would he have said something like that? Why would he say, go into all the world and preach the gospel and baptize? Now, some will argue, though, that a person is saved first and then baptized, merely by merely being an outward display to confirm their commitment to God. Still others would uh, act insulted if you were to mention baptism. Seeing it as a legalistic work, and which is uncharacteristic of the freedom that we have in Christ. Especially in view of one being saved by grace, Ephesians 5, or excuse me, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. <clears throat> Sorry, I mowed the yard and trimmed the bushes this weekend and all that dry grass. Also, when we look to the Lord, and we see the words in John 3, 16, and he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Regardless of all the protests, all the hypotheticals, and even quoting scripture, <coughs> some fail to still see the fact that Jesus said baptism was necessary. It, <coughs> is belief essential to salvation? Just my throat. <clears throat> is belief essential to salvation? There can be no doubt. We have to have belief. Is baptism essential to salvation? Well, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, any rule of grammar that one chooses to use, his meaning is very clear. To be saved, one must be baptized, but they also must believe. The two go hand in hand. And in fact, in your bulletins, not only did I include this article, but on the inside page, there's another article 
dealing with Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. But when we look to Jesus' words, it cannot be construed from his very plain teaching, his statement, that one believes is saved and then baptized. We cannot get that out of there. I, I have read many commentaries and, and works by men, and, and they will take verses like Mark 16, 16, and they'll say that, well, doesn't say anything about baptism in the second clause. We'll get to that. They'll take verses like Acts 22, verse 16, and they rearrange the whole wording where Ananias tells Paul to arise and be baptized, washing away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, they change that verse to say that Paul called upon the name of the Lord and was saved and then baptized. You have to totally rewrite that verse to get that. Well, when one says, I don't have to be baptized, they're exactly right. You don't have to be. God gave us free will. We have a choice. Now, you don't have to be baptized. Unless, of course, you want to be saved from your sins. Because that's exactly what the Bible tells us. If one insists that baptism doesn't have anything to do with being saved, he's calling the very Son of God a liar. Because Jesus says that it does. And what about that John 3.16 then? Well, Jesus is not contradicting himself. The person who truly believes it will do all the things the Lord says are necessary for salvation. And he will never perish. Now again, for the full article, it's in today's bulletin. But with all that said this morning, I want us to take some time to look at the Bible and take only what we learn from the Bible as we examine the issue of baptism. As we talked about in the Bible class this morning. You know, the, the one thing we want to do in any of our personal studies, we want to get right into the Word of God. We want to open up the book. We want people to read and see for themselves. It's not just us saying that. This is what God has said. Well, when I look at the New Testament, the first place that I find or read of baptism in the New Testament is Matthew chapter 3. And here, the context is before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And John, called the baptizer or the Baptist, that's not his last name. He was called that because he baptized people with water. And he was a forerunner of Jesus, and he was a prophet. Now, his preaching, it served to confirm him as, as a voice of one crying in the wilderness. And this is a reference to Isaiah 40 in verse 3, where it says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, while there was a direct meaning to Israel in that day and time, Matthew's use of that verse is showing the extended prophetic meaning with the preparation of the Messiah. We look at Matthew 3, verse 3. And then in Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2, it says that John preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message was one of repentance, to think differently, to reconsider morally, to feel uneasiness or uh, of the conscience, guilt, regret, to feel wrong for what they had done. And the reason the kingdom was very near and soon to be a reality. In 2 Corinthians 7, in verse 10, we read, Paul writes, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Repentance, converting one's will to God's will. And thus, Jesus also saying in Matthew 18, in verse 3, Unless you are converted and become like little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, here in this word converted, being to turn around or to reverse, to turn back again. And this is much like what we read in Acts 3 and verse 19, when Peter told the people to repent, therefore, and be converted, that their sins may be blotted out. And this is a follow-up to what we read in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 2.38, when the people were told to repent and be baptized to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. These people also, having heard the gospel, having heard that they had just crucified the Messiah, that Jesus of Nazareth was 
Messiah. They cut them in the heart. And they asked, what do we need to do? Peter didn't say, well, just believe that Jesus is the Christ and you'll be saved. His answer was to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. Now, in addition to preaching repentance, we learn that people came to John in Matthew 3, and verse 6, it says, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, when we read the accounts of Mark 1, uh, verse 4, and Luke 3, and verse 3, it also says of John that he went to all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Remission, meaning a freedom, a pardon, a deliverance, a forgiveness, liberty. One reason we learn that he was in the region is also told to us by another John. When we read John 3, verse 23, it says, Because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. Now, the word baptized, it comes from the word baptizo. It, it's a transliteration. We just transliterated the word into English. It means to immerse, to submerge, to make well, fully wet. Watch. It's significant because when we read things like the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8, his conversion with Philip, we read in verse 38 that they went down into the water and he baptized them. And they came up out of the water. Also, if, if baptism was any means other than a, an immersion in water, I'm sure they had a canteen on the chariot. They just poured it over his hands. I was doing jail ministry and so I representative of another Christian faith, and we were talking about baptism in the lobby of the jail before going in to, to do our Bible study, our respective Bible study, and uh, with the gentleman I was with, we had a couple baptisms planned for that night, and he said, well, how, how do you baptize him? Well, we got a poor little baptistry that the, the sheriff has provided. You know, I didn't know that, because I've just been bringing in a bottle of water and pouring it over their hands. And so we started to have a discussion with him, at which point when we broke out the Bible and started reading the Bible, he didn't want to study any longer. But anyway, we see the Ethiopian went down into, they came up out of. Baptizo, meaning to wash, very significant. So what was the word of Ananias to, uh, to Saul in Acts 22, verse 16? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins. Great brother Marshall Keeble said he knew a lot of smart women in his day. They didn't know any that were so smart, though, that they could take it, you know, clean the laundry without washing it. So in the same way, men are dirty with sin. We wash. Well, John's baptism was a divine ordinance from God to separate the people of Israel and to prepare them to receive the Messiah. Baptism was of God. It wasn't of men. And Jesus' question to the Pharisees is pertinent. Today, many confuse us. See, baptism is a work, a work of man. And then we go back to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and you're saved by grace and not by works. Well, what was it that Jesus said in Matthew 21 and verse 25 when he questioned the Pharisees? The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe? Jesus, when speaking of John the Baptist, we read in Luke 7, verses 29 to 30, it says, Even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God themselves, not having been baptized by him. Notice that? By refusing baptism, they rejected the will of God. The question, where was baptism from? God or man? Rejecting baptism, they had rejected the will of God. John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Matthew 3, verse 11. To reject God's will is to sin. And John baptized only with water. 
How much more is it sin to reject him that was coming with a greater baptism, who was greater than John? Now, John's reference then being, when we look to it, only one baptism for us today. This was commissioned by Jesus himself when we read Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Ephesians 4, verse 5, telling us that for us today there is one baptism. And thus the baptism of the Spirit and fire being a double metaphor, dividing John's hearers into two parties. Those of the Spirit, those who would obey God's will, being baptized, and those of fire, those being disobedient, rejecting the baptism, and thus lost. Well, when we view Jesus' death on the cross, we see that it was foretold. Jesus' whole reason for coming to the earth is given to us when we read Matthew 1 and verse 21. For he will save his people from their sins. Well, how is he going to do this? Well, for the sake of time, we're not going to examine this for it. Suffice to say, we know what Paul stated. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, he says, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Notice that according to the scriptures. It was foretold. This is God's plan. It says that he was buried and he that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This has all been foretold. One of the sad things was the rejection of Jesus by many of the Jews. This was exactly what had been foretold and what they had been waiting for. Time and time again, Jesus' purpose for miracles to confirm that he was the Messiah, that he was who he said he was. But they missed it. Paul, writing to the brethren in Rome, Romans 6, and verse 10, he says, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. No longer was the yearly sacrifices needed to be made. Also, Paul stating to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. This would bring those Jewish people's minds right back to God, bringing them out of the bondage in Egypt. Here's one greater. would bring them out of the bondage of sin. Jesus is back upon the cross like the blood of the Passover, the, the lamb of Exodus that allowed God to pass over the homes of those who did what? Simply believe? No. They applied the blood to the doorpost and the windows. Just as our Passover will pass over our sins for the blood, for those who have the blood applied to them today. And just as the Hebrews had to do something, they had to believe, but they also had to obey God. Applying that blood to the doorpost, we too have a requirement laid upon us to receive God's salvation. It's a gift. But as any gift, there are requirements to receiving it. You ever hear you know, the disclaimers when they advertise something on the radio that you know, there's something they're giving away? It's a prize. It's their grace. They're giving that away. One of the radio stations have been advertising it's $1,000 they give away on the radio. But then there's qualifications in order to receive that $1,000. We accept that in life. We understand that there are requirements sometimes to receive a gift. Even a gift given to us, it's wrapped up. That was the person's grace. They bought that, they packaged it, they gave it to us. But there's a requirement. I have to take the bow off. I have to rip the wrapping paper off. I have to open the box. I have to take the gift out and use it. We understand these. Like John, during his earthly ministry, we read that, uh, that Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, verse 17. Also, we note that before Jesus' death, in speaking to Nicodemus, Jesus says in John 3 and verse 5, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus was explaining what one must do in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, which was at hand. It was near. It was very close. In describing water, Jesus is explaining the mode by which one finally submits to the will of God, having heard, of course, and believed that Jesus is the Christ, creating in them a penitent heart and confessing their faith. 
nothing special about the water. They're not meriting, we aren't meriting any salvation by any work of man. We're merely submitting to the will of God. Having submitted to God's will with baptism, the final act, like those on the day of Pentecost, they received the gift of the Spirit. That means salvation. We read in Acts 2 and verse 38. They were washed of their sins, like Saul in Acts 22 and verse 16. And after Jesus' resurrection, in speaking to the disciples, he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. He goes on, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And what will I do to you always, even to the end of the age? Go forth, make disciples. There's a teaching involved. That teaching gets one to the point where they believe. Believe it. They submit to God's will. They are baptized. From that point on, there is additional teaching. And Jesus says to teach them all things, which would include to go out and to preach and to baptize. Because if that's what I was taught, and I was commanded to teach you all things I was taught, that's what I'm going to teach you. And when you go out, you're going to teach others and you're going to teach them to baptize and to teach. That's how Christianity works. That's how it spreads. That's what they were doing in the first century. And that's why it was turning the world upside down. Because that's what they were doing. When we look to the book of Acts, when we look to the Gospels, everything before Acts chapter 2 and Jesus' resurrection speaks of the kingdom as being However, everything after which speaks of the kingdom as having come. In Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, Jesus uses the terms kingdom and church interchangeably. And we see the epistles that are addressed to the churches, to the church of Ephesus, to the church of Smyrna, to wherever it was. That the churches had come. That Jesus said, I will build my church. In the kingdom, they're interchangeable. If we have any doubt about whether the church and the kingdom has come, when we read Revelation 1, verse 9, John clearly states to us, he says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. There's no future reign of Christ. He's reigning now. There's no kingdom coming on earth. The kingdom's already here. In fact, Jesus even told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then my followers would have rose up and thought that the Jews would not hand me over to you. But my kingdom is not of this world. It's a spiritual kingdom which cannot be shaken. Now, the one greater than John has come. And no longer is John's baptism of repentance sufficient as the kingdom is no longer at hand. But it's here. Jesus said of his blood when he instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26 and verse 28, he said that his blood was shed for the remission of sin, for the sin, for, or was shed for the remission of, the, of sins for men. In addition, it was for the new covenant that God had promised. When he says that his blood was shed for the remission of sins, the same language is used in Acts 2.38 when Peter says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Note that the baptism preached on Pentecost included the name of Jesus, just what Jesus said, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Whatever you do, the word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. He's been given all authority. We see that it was for the remission of sins or the pardon, the forgiveness, the freedom. To make baptism an outward expression that one has already been saved is to say that Jesus shed his blood on the cross because we were already saved. How does that even begin to make sense? That Jesus, because we're already saved, 
that God was heartless and would give his only begotten son to die and shed his blood because you're already saved? Make baptism an outward expression of one's already been saved. Further, we read in Acts 19 where Paul encountered some who were baptized with John's baptism. And as Paul says, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard of this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 19, verses 4 and 5. Why did Paul just tell them, well, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're already saved? That's not what he told them, was it? They needed to be baptized according to God's plan after Jesus' death, burial, burial, and resurrection. Just as that is what's applicable to us today, living after the cross. This is also why uh, one of the several reasons why the thief on the cross in Luke 23 is not an example to us today of salvation after the death, burial, and resurrection. And speaking to the church in Colossae, Paul wrote in Colossians 2, beginning in verse 11, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. That's what he's saying here. We put off the whole body of sin, the circumcision of Christ, by being baptized. And that it was the will or the working of God. It's not a work of man. While well, the Jews had a literal physical circumcision as a sign, an outward sign of the covenant they had with God, today God calls for spiritual circumcision for those who would be his. Paul would even make the argument, was Abraham justified before or after circumcision? So it wasn't circumcision that marked their covenant with God, that outward sign, but the circumcision of the heart. While the old circumcision was made by human hands, a, a small outward part of the body, God calls for the complete severing of the old man of sin, which he accomplishes through baptism when we submit to him. And speaking to those in Rome, beginning in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, Paul writes, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, notice, he was raised by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer slaves of sin. Notice what he says here about baptism. That we are baptized in the likeness of Jesus' death, that our old man is crucified, that man of sin is put to death in baptism. It's no way. We're buried with Christ in baptism, putting off the body of sin. True spiritual circumcision. dead to sin through faith in Christ. When we look to the Ephesian letter, which we'll look at in more detail this evening, we see that those that Paul is writing to in that Ephesians, when we look to Ephesians chapter 1 and the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2, they had already been baptized. He's writing to Christians. They had been dead in sin, but were now made alive when we start chapter 2. That's why when we get to verses 8 and 9, he says, by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith leading to obedience, the will of God, not the work of man that we should boast. We are then raised with him in baptism, the sins removed as the flesh was cut off, cut coming up out of the water associated with Christ's resurrection. Christ went into the grave, he came up again, 
The believer disappears under the waters of baptism, where he puts to death the old man of sin, and he comes up in newness of life. It is faith in the working of God. God raised Christ from the dead. The connection is removing us from having been dead to sin. To which Paul writes to those Ephesians. Just as it was asked of John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? Ask yourself the baptism that God now commands. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Is it a work of man, or is it a requirement of God to be saved? Quick examples of baptism in the lesson be yours. Jesus in Matthew 3, verse 13, we read, came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Paul, the Hebrew writer, Peter, John, they all say that Jesus had no sin repent of. Remember, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. John the baptizer also stated, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me. Matthew 3, verse 14. Interesting to note here also that although Jesus declared that there was not one born great, born of woman greater than John, Matthew 11, verse 11, John acknowledges that even he is not exempt from the necessity of and then he considered Jesus, who had no sins to repent of, to wash away. And yet in Matthew 3, and verse 15, he says, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. While having no sins, Jesus acknowledges that baptism is a requirement of God. It is binding upon all men, even him in his earthly form. Jesus, while man, he submitted to the Father's will. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Even in this, not a work of man, but of God. Let's stand and worship folks. When we look to the book of Acts, it's often called the book of conversions because we read of it in many accounts of people being converted to Christ. Those people being saved and added to the kingdom. And while we are saved by the grace of God, it is never apart from certain requirements of man. We saw this last two weeks ago. Paul in Acts 27, that they are going to be shipwrecked, and no life will be lost. The angel promised, you're going to stand before Caesar and Rome. And then the, and the men that you pray for, they're going to be granted to you as well. But you have to put ashore on this particular island. So there was a requirement of all. What about Naaman? We looked at it last week. First Kings, or I'm sorry, 2 Kings chapter 5. In Hebrews 11. Uh, a listing of those of faith. We know that the faith is coupled with their obedience to God's will. At Abel, but not obeyed in the sacrifice, would the Lord have respected his offering? Would God have taken Enoch if he had not first pleased God? If Noah had faith, but did not obey the Lord in building the ark, where would he or we be? All through the Old Testament, God has always placed blessings before the people, but they were not without requirements upon the people to receive the blessings. In Acts, we read of eight examples of conversion. And while not everyone lists all the things required to do to be saved, we do learn what God requires because of the totality of the teachings. We can never take one thing that the Lord says about a particular subject and build a doctrine on that. If we're going to look at what the Lord says on a subject, we need to look at all the things he says on the subject. Then we get the totality of God's word. Now, in some cases, certain acts are clearly stated. Some, they're implied. But in all cases that we read, it speaks of baptism. There's not a case in Acts of conversion that you will read of that it does not say There's five essential things that we learn of when we read the New Testament in regards to our salvation. One, we have to hear the gospel. Romans 10, verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
Hebrews 11, verse 6, saying, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If we don't believe, we're not going to seek him. We're not going to do the things required by him, nor will we be pleasing to God. Having heard the gospel, so as to instill faith, we must also move us to sorrow for our sins, leading us in a change of direction. This is also called repentance. As we previously saw, it's leading to salvation. It's a step in the right direction, but you're not there yet. Having heard and believed, producing repentance, one must also confess their faith. Jesus saying, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10 and verse 32. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, also telling us that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Notice again that faith and confession are unto righteousness. Further steps stemming from faith. But we're still not to salvation. Or we're closer. But we're not there yet. Also, for those who hold the faith only, they don't deny these verses we just read. And therefore, they show faith only. Also, because of these steps, we can small children, those with mental disabilities, they're not candidates for baptism. They don't have sin or the understanding to confess the Lord Christ. There is. Finally, one must be baptized. We've seen that the Lord himself has already commissioned it in Matthew 28. We have seen that it is a commandment, Acts 10, verse 48. Some have reasoned, like Haman, that there's nothing special about the water. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 12, the NSA aren't the waters back home better than the Jordan? There's no saving power in the water. Nothing special about this water that we have. We have a tithe right here. You can go down to the bay and get baptized. You can go to the motel and be baptized. We see what's important is it's a command of God. It's a requirement of God. It's obeyed by those who have a good conscience. In Acts 2, verse 38, Peter declares it is necessary for the remission of the freedom sins. Jesus himself saying, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. Why would we then contradict the Savior himself? I told you we get back to the second clause of this verse. The some argue that the second part of Mark 16, 16, it doesn't mention baptism. But if one didn't believe, they wouldn't obey to be baptized. And if one was baptized but didn't believe, they haven't fulfilled the command. To believe and be baptized. As my good friend always says, if you didn't believe, you just got wet. So I'm already going to need to be baptized again. If you weren't baptized correctly the first time, you weren't baptized. You just got wet. You need to be baptized correctly. Nor have they submitted to the righteousness of God. And so baptism need not be even mentioned in the second clause. It's moot. It doesn't matter. But you did not believe. The Bible teaches that we have not done that which puts us into Christ when we deny the essentialness of baptism. In Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27, Paul states, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. <clears throat> Baptism is the final step that puts us into Christ. Make no mistake about it. Baptism alone will not save you. Just as faith alone will not save you. Confession alone will not save you. In fact, many of the Pharisees believed that Jesus was the Christ, but they wouldn't confess him because of fear of being put out of the synagogue. Even the demons believe and tremble. One demon even confessed, what do you have to do with us, O son of the most high God? He believed and confessed. 
don't think we think the demons are saved. Baptism is that final step. It's the final act of contrite heart, the willingness to submit to God. This morning, the question is, have we submitted to God? If we have not, hopefully we know now what we need to do to what God requires of us. And if we have obeyed God, and we have fulfilled what is required, are we continuing one of those things we often overlook? Be thou faithful unto death, thou give the crown of life. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Yeah, we can lose our salvation. We need to make sure that we're staying in the faith. This morning, we offer an invitation. If you have not as yet obeyed the gospel, do you now understand what it requires? That's the first part of the teaching. And then we can work on teaching you all things about this group in this community. But the first step, we've seen. And if you're at that point, and you're ready to If you want further study, we'd be happy to help you with that too. And if you have obeyed the Lord, you have been baptized, but you're not remaining faithful, then you need to change this. It's a public sin. It's between you and her. I'm sorry, if it's a private sin, it's between you and God. And if it's a public sin, then it needs to be addressed as publicly as those who are aware of it. But don't let it go unchanged. Don't let it go in the way. James teaches we're not promised tomorrow. Life is but a vapor. So I